Bob Sullivan presents Catholic Perspectives on the Reformation, Part 4, Apologetic Perspective, at this year's Catholic Coffee House. This production is brought to you by the Diocese of Lincoln. All right, thank you, Father Heeslip. Uh, <clears throat> tonight's talk is ab about the Reformation, uh, what, I, what I like to call the Protestant Revolt, um, and how to approach our separated brothers and sisters uh, in a charitable and effective way. And there's a right way and a wrong way to do it, and I've done them both, unfortunately. But uh, hopefully I'm doing it the right way more often than not now. So uh, what I call it is evangelics, and uh, it's a combination of apologetics and evangelism because if you just do one or the other, especially if you just do apologetics, uh, it can be a little bit um, it can be a little bit cold. So it's important to always uh, share the gospel with the people as well. And with our separated brothers and sisters, they love the gospel, they love scripture, and so it's a nice way to uh, kind of have a common ground to work with as well. But almost all apologetics refers to First Peter three. Uh, to always, you know, have, a, have an explanation for the hope that's within us. But a lot of people always forget the last part of that, uh, and that is to also always, you know, do so with gentleness and kindness uh, and charity in your heart, uh, because you don't want to win the argument but lose the soul. Uh, you don't want to win the argument and lose the possible convert. So uh, 1 Peter 3, 5, or 3, uh, 1 Peter 3, 15 through 16 is an important uh, Bible verse for us. Um, so what we, what, over the years, I've kind of compiled a list of very common things that I end up talking to uh, our separated brothers and sisters about. And, uh, of course, we've got the solas. So we've got faith alone, um, which if you read more and more about it, uh, on the surface it seems that faith alone is really attack on works. Um, and a lot of our separated brothers and sisters will criticize the Catholics for having a theology that we believe that we can work our, our way into heaven. Uh, but we know that uh, that's a heresy that's been uh, dispelled by the Catholic Church centuries ago. So really what it is, it's more of a, an assault on reason. Uh, and it goes back to um, Martin Luther's approach to theology, which was, uh, you know, all you need is the Bible. You don't need to think about this stuff too much. Just it, you can find it all in Scripture. Uh, and so then that led him to Bible alone. And that is really attack on papal authority and the teaching authority of the church, uh, and so, it, it, again, it's, it's an attack on the, the authority of the church uh, overall, and I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, then the, the third main sola is grace alone, which is more of a distinction. Um, it's a false distinction because as Catholics we do believe that, you know, uh, grace does save us. It's just not that faith alone saves us. It's uh, we're saved by grace. Uh, then there's a couple of uh, solas that were added, and I have those in a little bit lighter color, which is Christ alone and for the glory of God alone. And I think those were just distinctions that came along later in the Protestant revolt to uh, try to differentiate the Protestant uh, view of things uh, from the Catholic view of things. Um, Martin Luther's, uh, if you read some of the books that I've got over on the table there, especially like Oh, probably uh, Brad Gregory's uh, new book on the Protestant Revolt, as well as um, uh, there's a, uh, I can't, the, the book's escaping now, but what it turns out is that Luther was really attacking uh, the idea of free will, and we see that a lot when we're talking with our non-Catholic brothers and sisters now, is that, uh, you know, we define free will differently than they do, and they don't think that there is as as much free will as we think there is in the world, and they'll, they'll draw distinctions between that. So that's another uh, point of contention between the two. Then we have Martin Luther's Priesthood of the Believer, um, and that uh, gives rise to the common phrase that, you know, you, there's only one mediator between God and man, which is a scripture verse, uh, but then they attack the priesthood because of that and the prayers to the, to the saints uh, and things like that. So uh, Priesthood of the Believer is a, a major point of contention. And then we get to Constantine. Of course, Constantine legalized Christianity uh, in the Roman Empire in 313 A.D., and a lot of people take that to mean that that's when the Catholic Church was actually formed, but it was actually, uh, there's a lot of evidence for the Catholic Church, including things like bishops and priests and the Eucharist and things like that, pretty important stuff for the Catholic Church, uh, well in advance of 313 A.D. in history. So um, Constantine did not start the Catholic Church. And then there's this idea that, well, at some point the Catholic Church went apostate, which meant that it started teaching error, 
uh, as doctrine. And uh, so my question to that is always, well, when do you think that happened and, and what caused that? I mean, what, what teachings are there? And then uh, the discussion ends up getting a little bit vague. Then there's always this uh, dispute about tradition, uh, Scripture versus tradition. And, uh, of course, in our catechism, we have the teaching that Scripture and tradition uh, are on equal ground and they go hand in hand. Uh, but a lot of people would look back at uh, faith alone and say that, um, you know, tradition is, is a problem that's been invented by the Catholic Church. Uh, but what we'll say is that tradition is, uh, is what gave us the Bible. So one of the handouts that you have tonight is a little green pamphlet called where, you know, How We Got the Bible. And uh, you can hand that to somebody that's talking about things like tradition uh, because it explains that actually the church came before the Bible. And uh, without the church and the church's tradition, we wouldn't have the Bible, at least not in the form we have it today. And our uh, last one on this page is the re-crucifixion. And this is one of the, uh, the more troubling uh, disputes that we have, is that some of our um, separated brothers and sisters will believe that at the Mass, at the consecration, that we actually re-crucify Christ. And uh, they think that that's a horrible thing, and, and it really would be if that's what we were doing. Uh, but what we really are doing is following Christ's command at the Last Supper um, and doing it in memory of him. So it's not, uh, it's not the re-crucifixion, it's the unbloody sacrifice. And I, this might be the one that I talk about later in the, in the show. So right now I'm just kind of giving you an overview of some of, the more common, uh, some of the more common things you'll run into when you're talking with our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. They'll say that we have unbiblical practices. Um, what I often tell them, and I was just at a talk a few weeks ago here in Lincoln, and I explained to the, uh, the, the entire non-Catholic church that the talk was at when they had a, a former Catholic come in and give a talk about how to talk to Catholics. Um, you know, I, I got the microphone right at the end, and I said, you know, one of the most difficult uh, church doctrines to probably teach from Scripture is the uh, ascension of Mary, the assumption of Mary. But I said, I can show you Bible verses that, can help you do that. They're implicit. They are not explicit. But every single teaching of the Catholic Church you can find in Scripture either explicitly, which it just absolutely says it word for word, or it's implicit. And so you can read it and you say, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that this teaching has some, some scriptural roots. And then you look back in history, look at the Church Fathers, um, and use uh, your logic and reason, which Martin Luther didn't really like the reason part, um, to, uh, to understand what the Catholic Church teaches. But uh, this, they'll say we have unbiblical practices. Uh, they'll say that we added the Apocrypha, which is the um, deuterocanonical books to us, and so books like Maccabees and Tobit. Um, they'll say we added those, but in reality we know that uh, Luther took those out of the canon uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Protestant revolt. The funny thing is, is that um, every complete printing of the Bible up until about 1580 uh, included 73 books. Uh, it was only after, um, well after the Protestant Revolt started, that the first 66 Bible, 66 book Bible was printed. Um, but uh, for some reason, they've been able to twist that and make people believe that the Bible, at some point, had uh, only 66 books prior to the Protestant Revolt. They say that we have the doctrine of salvation wrong, and uh, I hope they're right because we also believe that you know if we believe and we profess him as our as our savior and we accept him uh, we do that as catholics um, we just believe that it takes a little bit more and so that's the white handout that you have the uh, the, ass the assurance of salvation um, about a year ago i did a, a pretty long article in the southern nebraska register and it was it came out of a lot of talks i was having online with some non-catholic um, uh, pretty anti-Catholic individuals, and, you know, they love to say, oh, well, all you got to do to be saved is believe and profess him on your lips and accept him in your heart, maybe say a Jesus prayer, um, you know, and, and I was thinking, gosh, you know, as Catholics, we don't really have one of those little, nice little formulas to do that with. So I ended up doing about a, I don't know, 1,500-page article on it, <laughs> so it wasn't a synopsis, but as best I could do, and then I developed out of that this pamphlet, Assurance of Salvation, which kind of differentiates between what the Catholic Church teaches on how you're saved uh, and, and compares it to what some of our uh, Protestant friends will say, uh, you know, what must I do to be saved? So this is something, that's a pamphlet that you could uh, hand to a family member or a friend or somebody who thinks that, uh, you know, an altar call did all they need to do. 
they'll often criticize us for things like Mariolatry. Um, you know, we have Marian doctrine and we have uh, Marian prayer practices, Marian spirituality, and they call it Mariolatry because they think it sounds so close to idolatry. It's funny, I suppose. I don't know. But, um, but uh, that's one, another one of the common criticisms we have. The way that you start that discussion, at least the m- most effective way I've found, is to, uh, is to talk about Mary as the mother of God because Christians have always believed that. And then in 431 A.D. at the Council of Ephesus, it was you know, definitively declared that Mary is the mother of God. She's the Theotokos. And from that, I found it to be pretty effective to start building, well, and this is why we believe these other things. This is why we believe that you know, she's a great, um, you know, a great saint in the church, the greatest saint in the church, human saint. Um, and so um, that's why we have these other doctrines as well, because she's the mother of God. And, and don't you think that's an important thing? And, and the fact is, is that she was declared mother of God 1,100 years before Martin Luther, uh, and actually even Martin Luther believed she was mother of God. So did Calvin, so did Zwingli. The early uh, church Protestants uh, believed that. And so it wasn't until uh, probably the last 300, 350 years that it started chipping away at that, and now a lot of people uh, outside the Catholic Church think she's you know, something that takes away from Christ when we know that she's something that uh, you know, she's kind of like the moon to the sun. She reflects Christ. Uh, her light is only because of Christ. Um, the papal infallibility is a fun one because they almost always misunderstand it. And if you really boil it down, I mean, I suppose they think he can always pick the triple crown winner of the horse races or he can always pick the Super Bowl winner. Um, but when you really explain, uh, here's what papal infallibility really means, uh, and it's pretty rarely used, uh, then they, I think they get a little more reasonable with that. So um, one of the questions uh, I think I want to answer tonight uh, is, in light of questions like that, how can you do evangelics, all right? And so um, the most important thing is to do it with joy. So you never want to, you know, try to go in and, and put on your game face and, and uh, you know, and rough somebody up because you're not going to do anything with that. So you want to do it with a smile on your face. You want to do it with joy. The other thing you always have to know is why you're Catholic, um, and I'll get into a little bit of that. I don't know if it's on the next uh, point or not, but know why you're Catholic, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, again, these book recommendations that I'm giving you are essential because um, you, get, you get knowledge from the books, but you also get a little bit of the, the author's character and the way that you can approach these things. One thing I found about um, Catholic apologists is a lot of them are former uh, non-Catholics. So people like Scott Hahn and, and, or lapsed Catholics that have come back. Jeff Cavins, I think, was raised Catholic, but uh, then left the church, became a minister outside the church for a while. Um, uh, Jimmy Aiken, uh, Tim Staples, Dr. D- Dr. David Anders, all these guys um, approach the issue with so much charity. Um, they don't take anything personal. Uh, they, they're very calm. They're very courteous. They're respectful. Um, and it comes out in the things that they write, and in the radio shows and television shows or TV uh, shows that you can watch them on, uh, there is a distinct difference between their approach to uh, apologetics and evangelization and what you see uh, from the other side of the aisle. You see, um, in a lot of cases, uh, anti-Catholics that are very bitter. Um, a lot of them are former Catholics that have fallen away and, and seem to have a, uh, you know, a vendetta, and they don't let you know, things like truth get in the way. And so it's, it can be very discouraging to watch some of the, uh, some of the uh, people from the non-Catholic side, uh, like Dr. James White um, and Mike Gendron and some of these others that like to attack the church. And then you compare that to what you see at like places like EWTN and Catholic Answers and, and Scott Hahn's um, you know, apostolate, and it is an absolute night and day difference. So by, by reading them, uh, by listening to them on the radio, you can really pick up a lot um, just by their uh, demeanor and their manner. Um, in addition to having book recommendations uh, for you and also that you can recommend to other people, and, and that's kind of a mixture of the books that I have over there. For instance, uh, Scott Hahn's Rome Sweet Home, I think is over there, um, is a great book to, you know, if somebody is a Reformed, uh, you know, or, former, or a Presbyterian or Reformed uh, Christian, uh, you know, that's what he was. And so it's a great book to explain to them from their point of view uh, a way to consider uh, the Catholic Church. And, and uh, Steve Ray was a former, I think, a Southern Baptist. So if you've got a friend who's a Southern Baptist, you know, Crossing the Tiber is a great book for them. 
Uh, so there's the book recommendations, but also being able to recommend to somebody else, an apostolate or an individual. So, uh, you know, recommending to them, listen to, e- listen to a Spirit Catholic Radio, uh, read the Nebraska Catholic Register, go to Lincoln Diocese website. Those are great resources as well. Uh, and on, uh, you know, Spirit Catholic Radio, you're going to get great shows like Dr. David Anders and, and Catholic Answers, and things speak to the people like that. So having something like that in your arsenal and knowing what's out there is a great, easy, very easy way to uh, engage in evangelics. And then uh, you always want to be able to also offer to talk with them more and, and uh, you know, give them your email uh, if they don't already have it or your phone number or just let them know that you're willing to talk about these things more because you don't have all the answers right here today and there's not enough time in the day to talk about a lot of this stuff so it's good for that to give them a resource give them an apostolate to go to and then to you know come back and ask you specific questions that might be on their heart after that Um, and then also to be prepared prepared with some essentials and that's where these pamphlets come in and those little cards that uh, Fran Pearson uh, printed up for us uh, these things are great things. So after the discussion's over, um, and I'll get a little bit more into that a little bit later, is that you can say, hey, you know, I, I got this pamphlet, and you, know, and you might be interested in this. And sometimes they'll say, oh, you know, I don't want any pamphlet. Um, or you might say, gosh, you know, I got, a, I, got a, I got this room sweet home in the trunk of my car. Would you be are you a reader? And, well, you know, I read some books. Well, great, I got a book for you to read. Um, almost everybody will take a pamphlet because, you know, a lot of, you know, there's not much reading there. But, uh, but if they don't take the book, then they'll take the pamphlet. Sometimes they'll take both, and it's nice to have those kind of things in your arsenal anyway. But I'm going to back up to the beginning, and how do you become uh, somebody that's going to be effective in sharing the faith with other people? And so before you do, you have to be. And so Cardinal Sarah uh, talks about, um, or I think his name is probably pronounced Sarah now, that I've learned that. Um, you need, to, you need to pray. You need to be, uh, take these things into prayer with you, be contemplative about it. Um, you know, you aren't going to be effective at really anything in your life uh, without prayer. Uh, it, it, it affects uh, your secular life. It affects your family life. It affects your, your faith life. And, it, and more than anything, I think it affects your ability to share, share the faith with others. So you have to take a lot of these things into prayer. Uh, another guy that uh, agrees with Cardinal Sarah is uh, St. John Paul II. And so we've got uh, some pretty heavy hitters there in the world of spirituality that talks about before we really turn and look at anybody else uh, in our faith life, we have to have been looking at God first and, and having a face-to-face conversation with God in, in, um, in adoration and in private prayer and the sacraments. So that's the very first step of becoming somebody that's going to effectively share the faith. Um, one of the first questions that I got when I started doing this is, should you even be doing this? You know, you don't have a theology degree. Uh, you know, you're a lawyer. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, I had to wrestle with that question, you know, gosh, should I be doing this? Um, family members would ask me that. They're like, well, you, I mean, you seem to think you know a lot. Um, but do you know it? I'm like, well, I think I know it. Um, but uh, so the problem is, is that uh, for ages, uh, all of our apologists, all of our evangelists, for the most part, uh, were priests and bishops, and some of them were, um, you know, nuns like uh, Catherine of Siena. But we've had we've had centuries of of you know the church, twenty centuries now, and up until the last few centuries, hardly any of the lay people, uh, you know, were out there uh, with any, I guess, with any fanfare anyway, doing any type of evangelization. So really, we get into this in the mid 1600s, and uh, one of the most well-known apologists of his day was Blaise Pascal. He was actually a mathematician, but uh, he was very good in dealing with atheists, uh, and he's got some great uh, he's got some great arguments for God. Um, and then uh, a couple hundred years later, we had some of the English writers, uh, uh, some of the European writers anyway, with um, you know Chesterton and and Belloc uh, come along. Then in the 1900s, Frank Sheet, our first lawyer apologist that I know of, uh, up until then, if you were a lawyer and you decided not to be a lawyer anymore and go into the church, you became a priest. But uh, Frank Sheed, he, he, uh, I think he stayed a lawyer, but also became a great apologist. And uh, so he's got a book out there called Theology for Beginners, which I would recommend. I don't think that's on my uh, table over there. And then in, uh, you know, in the 1900s, we had a, really a resurgence of lay people uh, becoming you know, active apologists. And so Carl Keating, a lawyer in San Diego, started Catholic Answers. 
and uh, and then he started, you know, be getting pretty well known because he's phenomenal at it, and uh, started building an apostolate, Catholic Answers, and so um, out of that we have Tim Staples and and Patrick Coffin used to be with them, and and uh, Jimmy Aiken, who's unbelievably intelligent, um, but we also have people like Peter Kreft and Scott Hahn. And those, these people we just know today, and a lot of it's because of the, the communication that we have, the media that we have, but it's also because of something called Vatican II. And so Vatican II gave, I think, lay people a little bit of an idea that, gosh, you know, I guess I can go out there. I don't have to be a priest. I don't have to be a bishop in order to share my faith with somebody else. And uh, so it's really these people that have encouraged me to feel uh, a little better about uh, sharing my faith with others. And it was kind of funny the other day I was in a, a fairly long uh, Facebook discussion and one of my greatest detractors on Facebook started saying, well, you have, under canon law, you do not have the authority to be saying anything about what the Catholic Church teaches. And I'm like, well, you know, I don't, I don't know where he's getting this, but I know he's wrong, but I can't show him that he's wrong because I don't know canon law. And uh, so then uh, a buddy of mine, uh, J.D. Flynn, ended up uh, seeing that apparently and uh, J.D. Flynn said, uh, well, yeah, it, Bob can say this. It's okay. And the, the guy said, what are you, a canon lawyer? And so happens J.D. Flynn's a canon lawyer. <laughs> it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen on Facebook. <laughs> this is awesome. So uh, he abandoned that argument pretty fast because I think J.D. even laid out the different parts of the uh, canon law that said, yeah, lay people can't actually evangelize and, and uh, apologize for the church. And by the way, apologize, I say apologize, I'm not saying I'm sorry for the church. Uh, apologetics is the explanation of the faith, the defense of the faith, so I think you all know that, but, you know, just in case. Um, and so, uh, you know, up until recently, the, the vast majority of evangelists and, uh, and apologists have been, uh, you know, Catholic priests and bishops, and it probably still are, because there's just a few uh, pretty well-known uh, apologists and evangelists out there, but... I think that we can all do our part, and, uh, and there's good reason for that. So why should we do this? You know, can we do it? Yes. Why should we do it? Um, it's because right now the population in the United States is 323 million people, roughly. Of that, about, uh, okay, so that's um, about the same population of the planet back when the apostles were walking the earth. It's 323 million. 72 million of us. Uh, check the box as Catholic if we're asked. Uh, some of us check it wrongly, apparently. Um, so there's about 17 million out of that 72 million uh, that actually practice the faith with some regularity. There is about uh, 1.7 million that are considered intentional disciples. So as you can see, out of 323 million Americans, there's a whole bunch of us that say we're Catholic. Uh, but of that whole bunch, there's only 1.7 million, roughly, that go to Mass every weekend, have a life of prayer, uh, financially support their church, you know, follow the faith uh, with an intention to deepen your faith. And this comes from people like um, Sherry Weddle, uh, which wrote a book called Forming Intentional Disciples. Taylor Marshall uh, has a website uh, that talks about this stuff. Matthew Kelly will talk about this stuff. Curtis Martin will talk about this stuff. And so what they say is about 10%, 7 to 10% of most uh, parishes have intentional disciples, uh, you know, about 7 to 10% of that parish is on a, a path of intentional discipleship. So that's the 1.7 million. So we have about 37,000 priests um, in the United States. And we have about 18,000 uh, deacons. So out of that, uh, that comes up to about 53,000, 55,000 uh, deacons. Um, and so we're expecting these 55,000 to, in theory, uh, evangelize the 323 million. And so that, that's not a great number because what happens is every priest and deacon has to evangelize almost 6,000 people in their life. And so, uh, you know, that's a lot of people. That ain't going to happen. So then what do we do? Well, we got 72 million Catholics. Maybe they each pick 1,300 Catholics and try to evangelize them and catechize them and sacramentalize them and, and get them on a path of discipleship. That's still a lot. That's probably not going to happen. Um, I don't know about it, Father Heeslip and Father Coulter could do it, but, uh, <laughs> but I don't know uh, if, if anybody really can. So then we say, okay, well then out of these 55,000, maybe they just go... Uh, to the 17 million Catholics that are going to Mass uh, pretty much every weekend. And, uh, well, that still means they got to 
really disciple along 309 people. And uh, is that a realistic number? We're getting more realistic, but I don't know if we're all that realistic yet. Well, if we just want them to take care of the 1.7 million intentional disciples we already have, then they can deal with 31 people. Now, that's doable. Our Catholic priests, I think, can all take 31 people that are already on a path of discipleship and do a really good job keeping them on that path of discipleship. Well, there's 1.7 million of us, right? 1.7 million of us that are on the path of intentional discipleship. At least I hope I am. I think I am. Uh, depends on the day. Uh, and so let's look at that. So if, if we're helping out, you know, we can all reach out to 190 people. And if we do that, we have now reached out to everybody in the United States of America. That's not too bad a number. But if we just look at the Catholics that are just checking the boxes, Catholics, and we say we're going to evangelize 43, you know, that's, that's within the realm of possibility. So this is kind of why we should be part of this game. We shouldn't just be leaving it up to the priests and bishops. Because if we're just going to build groups and find 10 other intentional disciples, people that are going to be in our prayer group, people that are going to be in our Bible study, people that are going to go to daily mass with us on a regular basis, we only have to find 10 other people. And if each of those 10 people find 10 other people, then we're on a path now. And so we can actually go back and re-evangelize the culture and uh, re-evangelize them to Catholicism. So this is why lay Catholics need to be part of the game here. So the umbrella of the revolution, I think I alluded to earlier, is, is authority. So uh, in, in my reading and in, in my perception, what the, what the Protestant revolt really came down to was authority. Luther didn't like the authority, and a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon for primarily political and economic reasons. And so the, what they found out was, holy cow, this guy just revolted against the church, and they didn't kill him. Uh, I kind of like what he's saying because what he's saying is there shouldn't be any Catholic church around. They own a lot of property. They own a lot of wealth. And I'm already kind of powerful because I got my little army here. If I team up with a couple other guys, we can go sack some churches. And that's exactly what they did. So the differences um, between the early reformers, early Protestants, uh, and, uh, and the Catholic Church was, was never um, a matter of Scripture versus tradition. And, and that's almost all what we hear now is that, oh, you know, you guys have, I can't understand, I can't accept the Catholic traditions. But that's not what the early problem was about. Most of the early problem was a difference in interpretation. And so, uh, you know, once uh, Martin Luther said, you know, we are own authority, we are the priesthood of the believers, and Bible alone, Scripture alone, you know, I can interpret it my way, then it really became, it's the same book, it's the same words, slightly different translations, a little thinner book. This is a non-Catholic Bible, 66-book Bible. Um, but, you know, we can teach everything the Catholic Church teaches out of a 66-book Bible, too. And it's the same words, but you just interpret them differently. And so when you're dealing with a lot of different interpretations, uh, then you are uh, dealing with a lot of different individuals. So what... Uh, what Christianity has always been, and what you'll oftentimes hear, you know, from the apologists, you know, on the radio shows primarily and in the books that you read, is that Catholicism is a both-end approach to Christianity, um, you know, Scripture and tradition. Um, it is, uh, you know, Christ and his church and the saints. It's, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot more to it than just the black and white. And what, the, what a lot of our non-Catholics uh, criticize us for is that they think it's black and white. It's either or. It's one or the other, but it's not both. And so that really comes down to a lot of that uh, interpretation again. So what happened was, um, you know, what I say here is I think Luther uh, didn't wrestle authority from the church and give it to the Bible. He wrestled it from the church and gave it to the individual, which has caused, you know, this immediate fracturing of uh, of the different denominations of the in, initially the Lutheran Church, and then we had you know hundreds of uh, non-Catholic denominations you know within a few hundred years, and actually I think it took less than four years for the first fracture because one of Luther's closest followers, while he was off in the Wartburg Castle, wrote a whole bunch of stuff and started denying the Eucharist and doing all kinds of things like within months. And uh, they had a separation. Luther had to come back and say, well, I wasn't quite ready to do that yet, and got him mad, and so he left, and, and uh, they never reconciled. And he ended up, you know, kind of starting his own church and doing his own thing, I think, up in, uh, up in the Netherlands. 
So um, I was just uh, I was on Facebook, I think, last week, and I'd already prepared all this, but then I see something from, uh, I think it's called Ligonier Ministries, and so it's uh, Albert Muller and R.C. Sproul, and, and they're kind of big names in the, in the non-Catholic uh, world. Uh, but they're even putting up posts, and they're criticizing their own churches for not having even Scripture during the Mass. You know, it's, uh, uh, they're saying, we've got a problem here. We've got a lot of music. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we're in a coffee house, not a church today, so you can have coffee. But they have it on Sundays in their churches. And uh, it's kind of a social club for some of them and a rock concert. And uh, these, this is them talking about themselves and the problem that they have. And that really comes because Luther wrestled authority away from the church and gave it to the individual. And a lot of those individuals now are choosing either not to have the scripture at church uh, or not to have church at all. And so uh, they're starting to recognize that now uh, like they, they haven't had to in the past because it wasn't, didn't used to be that way. So what I'm saying is authority is key. And so that's why we have to begin and emphasize uh, Scripture, because that is what they say their authority is. So when you're talking with a non-Catholic Christian, you always want to be able to show them something in Scripture to give a basis for what you're talking about. Um, what you'll do is you will, um, you'll start with a 66-book Bible. I actually bought this Bible at Catholic Social Services over there in their used books. I think it cost $2. So it's a 66-book Bible. It's the Revised Standard uh, Edition, I think. And uh, so when I'm on the street, I've had a lot of people, um, or when I go to a non-Catholic speaker and, and ask questions and talk to people, they'll be like, oh, well, you got, you know, let's look in your Catholic Bible. And I can say, oh, no, this is a 66-book Bible. What do you want to look at? You know, and then we look at it in their Bible uh, because I can show them everything I need to show them in their own Bible, play on their, on their terms uh, with what they say is their authority. And then we always want to... Um, uh, use other resources after you have exhausted the scripture verses. So, for you know, depending on the the issue, you might be able to say, well, let's look at these thirty scripture verses. You know, the Eucharist. I can I can point to I think over twenty five scripture verses to explain the Eucharist and why we believe that it's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Um, but it, you know, if we're looking at the Assumption of Mary, then we might just look at uh, the Assumption of Isaiah, the Assumption of Enoch. And in Jude one eight, look at the assumption of Moses potentially, which is taken from an apocryphal book, but it's mentioned in the Bible. And so we might look at those three verses. By then, they're probably going to mention something outside the Bible because they always do. They, you know, once you have said, "Well, I, I can show you in Scripture where we believe this," then they'll bring up, "Well, you know, uh, the Crusades were bad." You know, well, let's talk about the Crusades. Yeah, we can talk about the Crusades. So then you go to history, and they're the ones that brought it up. But you don't want to start out with history. You don't want to start out with the early church fathers because they're going to say, that's not in the Bible. So you start out with the Bible, and you exhaust all of your Bible resources. And by that time, they'll bring up something, and then you can talk about the early church fathers, or you can talk about a specific saint or a, or a church council or a church document. So... Let them uh, go outside Scripture um, because they, they almost always uh, do, depending on the length of the conversation. So, um, effective evangelics with non-Catholic Christians. Um, the first thing you have to do is you have to pray. Like we said, uh, St. John Paul II, Cardinal Seurat recommend that. Can't do anything on our own. We also have to listen. Uh, the, the big problem that a lot of people have with evangelics and evangelization apologetics is we want to talk, we want to get our point across, but we don't necessarily listen to what they say. What I liken that to is, you know, there's police officers and there's firemen. Police officers drive around the community and they're always looking for trouble. But firemen sit in one place until the call is made and they go to the source of the problem. So we want to be more like firemen in our evangelization. We want to listen to what they are saying so that we know what they need to hear. Uh, because we can throw all kinds of stuff at them. 2,000 years of Christian history plus the Old Testament uh, is about 4,000 years of stuff, and nobody has the patience for that in a conversation. You're going to be doing a lot of miss. So you, wanna, you actually want to hit the points, so you listen to what they say, and then they'll tell you where you need to go. Uh, as they're talking, you need to think. You need to think, gosh, you know, I think what they're saying is this, and I understand this, and, and uh, be ready to offer them something. Um, I think I was just talking to, I think, Vern a little bit earlier, and, and uh, you know, some people say, well, gosh, you're a convert, so you must know the Bible. 
Well, as Catholics, we know the Bible extremely well. Now, we may not know the chapter and the verse, but we know the stories because we hear them every time we go to Mass. We hear uh, Old Testament, and we hear at least two books of the New Testament plus the Psalms. We're extremely familiar with it, and so we don't want to get... We don't want to get this inferiority complex saying, gosh, you know, we need to give, uh, you know, scripture and verse for everything we're talking about, because you don't. You can, just, you can just say, well, gosh, you know, the Bible says, you know, this, that, or the other, and they're going to know what you're talking about. And if they say, well, where's that in the Bible? You can say, well, you're the non-Catholic. You told me where it is in the Bible, because <laughs> you know it's there. Um, but, uh, but, you know, have a little bit of self-confidence when you're talking about scripture, because you know the stories. Uh, and then... You get into the asking the questions. You, you, you know, I think as uh, Patrick Lencioni says, uh, people want to be reminded uh, more than they want to be taught. And we all know things, um, and, and we've just we've gotten a little fuzzy on them or foggy on them or we've overthought them. And so what we really want to do is, uh, is ask questions to get them to think, um, to remind them of some of the answers that we all know is there. And so this is what's called the Socratic method, you know, who, what, when, where, and why. Um, so that's what you do is you listen, and then you start posing the question, um, well, where did you get that? Uh, you know, why do you think that? Or where's that in the Bible? So at that point, if you've hit something that is pretty significant, and they're like, ooh, I don't like the way I'm going to answer this, they're going to dodge the question. So you've got to hold them to the question. So after you've asked the why, listen again. And if they aren't answering your question, then simply restate the question. And then what you want to do is you want to challenge them. So you give them the challenge of, you know, I've got this pamphlet, or I've got this book, or here's this author I think you should look up, or, you know, send them something off of the uh, Internet, a a clip from a website, a video off of uh, YouTube, something like that, to help them to challenge them and say, I want you to think about that so that you can, um, so that we can come back and talk again later. So how do you employ the Socratic method in evangelics? And that's where you ask these questions. You don't want to say, well, here's why you're wrong, and here's you know, what you need to do, and I've got all the answers. You let them, again, do all the talking. You ask them um, where and how and why did you get that. Now, one of my favorite questions is to ask people, what faith are you? So like if we're doing St. Paul Street evangelization down in the Haymarket, uh, somebody comes by, and we offer them a rosary, and they might take the rosary, and I'll say, oh, are you Catholic? And they'll say, no, no I'm, um, you know, I'm Lutheran, or I'm Methodist, or Presbyterian. And I'll say, great, oh, that's nice. I said, why? Why are you that? Because one of, the, one, of the, one of the favorite questions that I used to ask is, why aren't you Catholic? And I don't care who they are. They almost always have really sound reasons, they think, for telling me why they don't think they're going to be Catholic but they've never thought about why they are what they are. What I almost always hear is what I hear exactly the same thing from Catholics is, uh, I married this person, or, you know, I, uh, my mom remarried, and, and so our family became this. I was raised this. Th- those are not good reasons to be any faith. The, the faith that you are should not be because somebody else chose it for you. It should be because you chose it, and there's got to be reasons for you choosing that faith. Well, that is one common ground between non-Catholics and Catholics is, A lot of us haven't really made an intentional decision to choose our faith. So I would challenge everybody here tonight to spend some time after tonight to think about why am I Catholic and what do I love about my faith and uh, why would I want to share this faith with somebody else because that's called your story. So you develop your story that way. So I believe that this is a better question than why aren't you Catholic Uh, because I've gotten some pretty funny answers. I remember one guy said because my brother's Catholic and that explained a lot. (laughs) So then you also want to stock the tools of evangelics. So you want the Bible. You always have to have a Bible with you. And, and oftentimes they don't even use it just because of the discussion. You can simply refer to the Bible. But if you're holding it, they're afraid you're going to open it up. <laughs> so just go ahead and hang on to this puppy um, and tab it. It's good to have it tabbed because that makes it even more shocking to them. So, uh, but you can talk about the, the different parts of the Bible, and, and, and it just really goes a long way. It, it, it's amazing how, how seriously they take that uh, in, and how much, how much credit they give to you for knowing the Bible in some way. Um, this one is, uh, is a revised standard, but uh, their favorites are the King James and the New International Version. And the funny thing about the New International Version is that some of its footnotes are incredibly Catholic, even more Catholic than some of the, you know, American Standard Bible and stuff like that. So 
uh, it's it's a kind of a fun one. But some of their footnotes are really anti-Catholic, though, too. Another a good book to have is the Catechism, and I put mine in a uh, I put mine in a little Bible holder, but it's the Catechism in here, and I've got that tabbed as well. I put it in here because I went I was going to a Mike Gendron talk about a year and a half ago, and I I knew I was going to need my Catechism in that talk because he likes to take a lot of Catechism passages out of context and claim that you know, we believe that we are saved by works, but he only takes half of a sentence. And if you read the whole sentence, it clarifies, we don't believe we can be saved by works. Um, and so I knew I had to have that, but if I would have walked in with a Catholic catechism, you know, they would have been all freaked out. So it, it looked like a Bible. I was okay. And so, uh, even though I had two of them, I had my Bible and the, and the catechism, uh, they, they didn't notice that. So have the catechism and have a few sections marked in that. Um, you know, specifically the ones on authority, on Scripture, um, because, again, you know, the Catholic Church believes that Scripture and tradition are on equal ground and both highly valuable to the faith. And what a lot of non-Catholics will tell you is that you put tradition above Scripture. So you can show them right in the Catechism. No, the Catechism says they're on equal ground. Also have some pamphlets. So these are, you know, tools that you want to have with you, some pamphlets. Those little cards are great little things that you can, you can even hand it to a waitress or a drive through person or, uh, you know, just somebody in conversation and say, hey, you know, here's a little fact about Catholicism that I think you might uh, find interesting. Um, so the pamphlets are, are here tonight. Also have some of these books. Um, one, of the, uh, one of my favorite reads, actually it's over there, I think I have it, is Jimmy Aiken's um, fathers know best. And a couple of these books, I think it's Catholic Survival Guide by Catholic Answers, which is a compilation of a bunch of apologetics writings by different apologists over there, so there's not one author. And then uh, Jimmy Aiken's Fathers Know Best are great because, uh, you know, John Henry Newman says to be uh, deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. The, the church fathers have caused the conversion of an immense amount of non-Catholics to Catholicism because a lot of uh, their ministers, a lot of their people that go to seminary for non-Catholic uh, faith can actually get through the seminary with hardly taking any church history. And it's becoming less and less common to take church, church history in some of these um, seminaries. So if you can introduce them to some of the church fathers and show that, yeah, I mean, this, this Sola Scriptura stuff, it doesn't show up in church history Here's the first few centuries of the church, and we see a lot of reference to the church's authority, to the pope and things like that. Those are really good books to have available to you, and they use them as reference materials. Also, CDs in the back of most of your churches are lighthouse uh, media kiosks. Take advantage of those. A $4 CD can answer a question for somebody at work. Somebody asks you, you know, why do you guys believe this? You can give them a CD and say, here, I got the CD for you. It's free. Um, and there's also a lot of books and, and pamphlets available on those usually as well. And then, uh, again, these authors over here, Peter Kraft and Scott Hahn and Jeff Cavins and, and some of these other uh, references are just phenomenal resources for us, and we really need to use them. Uh, they're out there. Most of it's free. You can get all of it online, typically, except for the actual uh, published books. But we need to take advantage of those things and, and be able to have these tools available for us. So in my car, I keep, I keep a few books and a few pamphlets and stuff just in case I run into somebody. Um, just the other day, my family was uh, in the park in Hastings, and we were having a little picnic, and this guy walks up with his dog, and he's going to evangelize us. And it was hilarious because he was blown away by the fact that I knew the Bible. And uh, he's like, do you read the Bible every day? And I said, yeah, I do. Wow, that's great. You know, that's great you do that. So now he's coming to our CIA class. <laughs> more, more as a skeptic, but, but he's coming. Yeah. So uh, the resources are, I think the register is a great resource, not just my article, uh, but there's great stuff in, in there every week. It's a great, it's one of the best publications I think there is. Um, my little pamphlet, Catholic Answers, Spirit Catholic Radio is, uh, you know, one of the most effective and phenomenal um, uh, evangelistic uh, things that we have in our state. Uh, and then there's this website called askacatholic.com which has, um, it's basically just a, a resource that points out all of the different topics you'll come up with, and then it hyperlinks to the scripture verses that back up the Catholic Church's uh, teachings. And so um, I, would, I would have that, uh, you know, on my saved pages on my computer, askacatholic.com. It's a really nice resource. And in my, uh, in my actual Catholic Bible, I also have something called Bible Thumpers. You can get them at Gloria Deo great. Those are great. There's also a two-sided 
um, laminated one that has, you know, Bible, Catholic Bible verses on it as well. But the Bible thumpers I like a lot more because you can actually write on them. So when I'm, when I'm praying or reading Scripture, and I'm like, wow, you know, this, this really proves to me that um, you can lose your salvation. I look on there, and it's like, hey, they don't have that one listed. So I add it, and then I've got another, you know, another Bible verse that I can use with somebody. Um, so I think this is the, are we saved by faith alone, um, is, is I think the one I'm going to kind of just touch on some of the apologetics. And these are two great quotes by Martin Luther. Um, you know, he really didn't like reason. Reason's the horror of the devil. And, uh, and then he goes so far as to say that God, you know, does good and bad, which is uh, kind of a new teaching in Christianity, not a very good one. So how far do you take that? So that's one of the questions that you can ask to somebody is that, you know, well, okay, so faith alone. Well, how far do you take faith alone? You know, if we're predetermined, uh, predestined for heaven or hell, uh, you know, who, you know, does God create people to actually go to hell? And some five-point Calvinists will say they do. You know, God does create people for the specific intent that they will go to hell because God does bad things. Um, and he say, okay, so you're saved by believing in God. And then you can say, well, gosh, you know, isn't believing an act? Isn't that an act? I mean, you have to actually have a mental assent to believe, right? That would be an action. Um, and so, is faith alone explicitly taught in the Bible? And I'll talk about the goalposts, I think, here in a minute. We'll go back to that. But the answer to that is no. Faith alone is not explicitly taught in the Bible. It has to take a misinterpretation. And so then you say, well, let's look in the Bible where, it's, where you think it says faith alone is actually taught. And so they'll give you some of these different verses, and they'll say, well, look at these verses. Faith alone. That's how we're saved. We're saved by faith alone because of these verses. And then they have to admit that those are implicit teachings at best. So it's implied, if you misinterpret these, that you're saved by faith alone. Okay, well, let's read them in context then. If you read them in context, almost everything that you read will show that their interpretation has to be wrong because it contradicts something else either right before or right after it, usually 100 words or less. And then you give them your scripture verses. And so, gosh, you know, it looks like, um, you know, St. Paul is talking about Mosaic law, the works of the law. Mosaic law is what can't save us. So let's give us our verses, you know, James and Galatians and Matthew. These are three verses that say that, um, you know, cooperation with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, you know, after baptism, uh, you know, lends to our salvation. But prior to baptism, none of those works would be any good. But after baptism, then we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. So it's not, it's not works alone. It's faith. Uh, it's, it's works after faith and works with faith uh, that actually is part of our uh, sanctification process. So the moving goalpost thing is something that I've found um, over the years. Uh, it's very disheartening. But basically, like I said, everything that the Catholic Church teaches can be found explicitly or implicitly in the Bible. Um, and so, like, an implicit teaching is a trinity. Uh, an explicit teaching is uh, Christ is the Son of God. So our critics will often rely heavily on their implicit teachings for things like faith alone and Bible alone and the different solas and different teachings. Um, and so they're relying on implicit teachings, but they refuse to allow us to rely on implicit teachings. They demand explicit teaching, teachings for everything the Catholic Church teaches. So that's the moving goalpost thing you know, that we need to call them on. And so when I was at that talk a few weeks ago, I brought this up in a room full of non-Catholics as to why, why are you allowed to use implicit teaching to justify your traditions, but we can't use implicit teachings to at least point you to the fact that there's scriptural roots and then show you 2,000 years of history on top of it, where you have to use implicit teachings, then jump ahead 1,500 years to show any type of history for it. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit disheartening to have to deal with that. So the, uh, oh yeah, they also compare the, the good apples to the bad apples. So what I oftentimes tell uh, somebody is, you know, they say, well, I've, I've seen Catholics uh, worshiping Mary. I've seen it. They've been on their knees in front of the statues, praying to Mary, saying, you know, Mary, save me. And, and uh, you know, my thought is, well, let's look at what the Catholic Church actually teaches, because that's in contradiction to what the Church teaches. And don't you know, don't hold my church to the lowest and worst example of an individual that you can find, and I won't compare your church to Joel Osteen. Does that sound like a fair deal? And they never think that sounds like a fair deal, but, uh, but that's kind of a fun one to, uh, to deal with. So the problem that we run into a lot of times is that um, there are a lot of barriers 
uh, to bringing somebody along. Uh, they'll oftentimes have uh, years of very good experiences in their faith. And if you listen to some of the non-Catholic converts that have come in, they'll talk about you know, how much they learned from their non-Catholic traditions in their, in their non-Catholic church and how grateful for they are for that and the wonderful people that they met and the, and the love that they received and, and all of the learning that they got. Um, they also have life experiences that might bias them against Catholicism. Uh, you know, they hear these, um, you know, these misinterpretations of uh, Catholic teaching and misrepresentations, and they don't really take the time to think about it because it's just, you know, they don't care. They're on their track. But then when they start thinking about Catholicism, these things start cropping up, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, you, know, you guys do worship statues, and, and Mary is the fourth person of the Trinity for you and stuff like that. And it's like, where in the heck do you get that? Um, so they also have a lot of social dependence, uh, you know, their social circles, their family members. Um, they might be financially dependent on their faith. They might be a minister or in the ministry. And so for them to actually consider coming to Catholicism can be a huge uh, rupture in their life, financially, socially, uh, family. It can be a real problem for them. Uh, so family ties. So in reality, when you're talking about scripture verses and church history and stuff like that, you know, they could literally be thinking, you know, that sounds pretty good. I, you know, it sounds like you're making a great case, but I'm never joining the Catholic Church because it's going to ruin my family. And so then what we have to our only advantage after that is the beauty and goodness of the church. So we show them the beauty and the goodness of the church through our joy. We show them, uh, you know, uh, through our actions, uh, virtue, truth, and honesty. Um, how prayerful we can be and, and uh, how charitable we can be to other people and to them. So that's uh, how we get past that, uh, that, that, those non-scriptural barriers to conversion. Um, so the, the, the apostles did not evangelize the world. What they did is they evangelized uh, a few people, and then those people evangelized a few more people. And so that's what we really have to do. It's kind of like eating an elephant. You know, you take it a bite at a time. So we aren't going to go out and change the world with what we do. But if we can just, you know, get one person to come along and, and be open to what we're talking about, um, then huge things can happen. So like the apostles did, they pretty much evangelized the whole world without even going out into the whole world uh, by doing small communities each time they went out. So, again, this is how you do it. You've got to pray. You've got, to, uh, you've got to follow these, these various steps of uh, evangelization preparation because we all have these people in our lives. We need to be charitable. Um, we need to allow them to see our joy and our love for Christ. Um, we need to be more confident in what we actually know about our faith and not be so self-conscious about what we don't know because even the greatest uh, apologists and evangelists, there's a lot they don't know. There's 2,000 years of information out there, so we can't let that hold us back. We've got to go with the stuff that we do know. Um, we have to know our own story, and we have to ask the right questions uh, because we want to ask them you know, why they are what they are, but we can only do that if we know why we are what we are. And then we have to challenge them at the end of it. So that's how, we, that's how we're really going to evangelize, um, you know, the people that we, that we uh, run into. And then finally, we need to be willing to follow up with them afterward. So after you follow all that up, you still have to say, and I'd love to talk to you more about this. You know, can we come back another time or go out for coffee or uh, here's my email address? And um, so that's how we're going to do it.